Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar. Um, this is on manufacturer product information and the digital future. Um, we're MBS and we're delighted to have you join in and listen to us. Just a few housekeeping rules before we get started. Attendees microphones are muted. All questions will be recorded and we will follow these up after the webinar. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to email those through to us or answer in the chat if possible um, and we'll respond to those questions um, following the session. Um, for any existing um, customers, if you are interested in anything that you see or you want to know more, um, please speak to your account manager or find out more by emailing info at the mbs.com. Um, and for any uh, people that are not clients of MBSs currently, again, if you want to know any more, please drop us a note at, at the email address there. Thank you. So the speakers today are myself, Lee Jones. I'm the Head of Manufacturer Solutions at MBS. Um, I look after um, a host of different things, but all revolving around um, construction product manufacturers and the manufacturer's um, partnership with, with MBS. Also joining me is my colleague, Dr. Stephen Hamill, who's the Innovation Director here at MBS. And Stephen's going to join us later in the webinar and give a demonstration of MBS's new um, cloud-based uh, product search engine, MBS Source. So let's get started. So just a quick reminder of who MBS are for people that um, might not know. Um, MBS have, providing, um, have been providing even construction product information and structured classification spec tools to the industry for the past 50 years now. Um, our clients from um, the specification side are made up of a multitude of different specifiers from architectural practices, contractors, engineers, um, basically anybody that would specify a product. But we also um, have the second side, which is all the construction product manufacturers. Um, there's a lot of brands and names here that you'll be familiar with. And what we do is we place those construction manufacturers' products and their data in front of the specifiers at the time that they need that relevant piece of information. So what we're going to cover today in this session is um, surrounding manufacturers' product data and, and how the digital future looks. Um, we've had a lot of talk and discussion and we've seen a lot of things about how our lives generally are just going more digital. Um, this is something that's been happening for, for quite a while, but obviously since recent times with the COVID-19 pandemic, it's become more and more heightened um, and something that we thought we'd like to share our knowledge with. So we're going to cover how manufacturers have provided data until now, what specifiers are looking for in respect to product data and how they consume this, how to approach um, current era and also the, the post-COVID-19 era. And this is how we feel things are going based on data, statistics, and, and what we're actually seeing as um, industry specialists in um, digitized information. I'm going to talk a little bit about PIM systems. Um, I'll get onto what those are a little bit later in the presentation, um, but mainly around efficient digital data management and how that's crucial and important for you as manufacturers um, to provide that data and how it's important for specifiers to also um, accept that data in that format. Um, we're going to look at some industry movements forcing change and then we're going to take a little steer from a colleague Stephen as how MBS can help um, and discuss some of the benefits um, from going digital for you and, and how you can get started. Okay so firstly let's have a look at um, how product data is used and, and provided today. For most manufacturers if you think about how um, data is currently stored within your businesses and how you provide this data to your customers um, this could be in a whole ream of different areas. Websites is an obvious one. Um, most people will have their own websites now. Um, these could be in data sheets, which are usually PDFs that people can download or be emailed. Um, you might have hard catalogues still. Um, we see a, quite a decline in these now as, as people want to consume more and more digital data, but they, they still exist and people do still send these things out. Um, then there's Excel files. Obviously, this, this is used widely by most businesses to manage certain aspects of data. Um, Internet Explorer files. Um, you might have folders on your um, servers, etc., that people store things in. And then there's also things like test certificates. So these might be linked to a particular test body through a, through a URL, or you might have a hard copy in a PDF format of a certificate that you host on your website or can provide to people. But then at the sort of further end of the spectrum, it could be in somebody's mind um, within your business, some of this technical information. So for a lot of manufacturers I've worked for, they've had technical helplines and there's, there's always one person that has this mass amount of technical knowledge in the business. And sometimes the things that they know aren't actually documented. They they own this data in their own, own mind. Um, so that isn't great for the specifier. It means that they have to come and communicate with you um, by telephone call, searching, and it really takes up a lot of time and it's a lack of efficiency on both parts. 
but it could also be on a piece of paper shoved in someone's drawer. Um, I've seen this quite a lot and I'm sure a lot of people listening will be familiar with these kind of things. So on that note, what are specifiers actually looking for? Well, the data that they really, really need is firstly performance information about your product systems. Um, how does it perform? What does it do? Specifics. Um, a lot of people find it very, very easy to find sort of marketing fluff, um, as it's known. So very salesy images and captions and um, different criteria and elements that, that go around um, making your products look look great online or in catalogs but it doesn't necessarily always contain that hard performance information more and more so now people are looking for sustainability information uh, we've seen a lot of the 2030 and 2050 climate challenges and these are focusing on uh, things like net zero carbon um, reduced water consumption a load of different things and this information um, is all reliant on you as manufacturers providing that data to the specifiers to allow them to create these buildings more efficiently there's then certification information. Um, we can't go a day really in the construction press without hearing or reading about um, issues that have happened within the industry and, and how products need to be certified a lot more um, accurately and more stringently. Um, and that's something that we're going to talk about a little bit later with regards to regulation. But that's the kind of thing that specifiers are also looking for. And then they also want this life cycle information. So. We're very familiar with the term value engineering, um, and we really need to turn that on its head from being about bottom end price through to actual life value. So um, is a product going to last? Is it durable? Typically, the um, in use phase of a building is around 200 times the cost of the actual build cost. So it's um, it's important for people, particularly when you're looking at government projects where you've got hospitals, schools, that kind of thing, where these are used massively with a lot of traffic and are expected to last quite a long time. Being able to calculate that life cycle information is, is very critical. Um, most specifiers are looking for um, technical performance way more than they are looking for price. Um, obviously, price does come into a lot of things, but this is the priority. They need to make sure, first and foremost, that the product is safe um, and that it meets all the relevant um, ethical criteria. And from the Construction Products Association um, report on product information that was um, published in October last year, 82% of specifiers were found to actually name specific manufacturers. So it is yourselves that they are looking to get this information from. What was also found from the CPA report, and you can see a little image of it there, um, this again is, is free to download from the Construction Products Association, we Association website, is that half of manufacturers say it's too hard to find information. Now, if you're trying to sell products and, and these are one of your key customers, that, that really is not good news. So we need to change this whole situation and make this a lot easier for people to work with. On that note, um, NBS held a um, Construction Product Leaders Summit in February in Birmingham. Um, and we heard some case studies. We had a client, which was Alan Q, um, who are the largest uh, social housing um, owner um, in the UK. Um, we heard from an architect um, in the form of Allies and Morrison. And then we also heard from Lango Rourke as a contractor. And for Alan Q, they were saying that their vision is simple. They want to control all of the information about all of their assets at component level. So that is all that manufacturer's product information ready on the fly to be able to be accessed and that's to do things like facilities management or even to assess things in a safety situation. From the specifier they're saying that specification and, and verification um, and the validation process um, needs to be um, much more straightforward. They like to compare products like for like and the only way that that's possible is having that data in a structured format from the manufacturers and being able to do that. And then for, for Lango Rooks, the contractor, um, a key note here is that product data for them, um, and if it's available digitally, allows earlier engagement within the supply chain. This is something that we've seen BIM um, obviously helping with. Um, construction product manufacturers will be um, no doubt more than familiar of being approached at sort of stage four um, of the REBA plan of works, the technical design stage, which is um, usually when procurement things start. But with BIM content, we're now seeing this engagement as early as stage two at the concept stage. So it really is um, worth taking note of and, and looking into. But the commonality between all of those three different um, characters and, and the quotations is that everything they're asking for is digital. So um, this information is the same information from you. It's just being asked for by different people within that life cycle. Just going to take a quick look at construction products and, and COVID-19 now um, and how, how digital um, is going to um, be impacted more moving from that. The RIBA. Um, 
or a um, body that obviously look after all of the um, the architects and chartered architects um, in, the, in the UK. And they did a lot of research at the beginning of the lockdown period. And what they found was that 81% of specifiers um, that, that were on their books are now actually working from home, um, or at least remotely. And I think that the main difference there, there was, there was probably a big bulk that, um, of the difference that it may have been furloughed, or there might have been some that have offices that they are sole people within that um, that business so they could continue. But there's a massive transitional shift there. Being able to go out and physically see somebody um, is, is no longer possible at the moment. Um, and it's looking not likely to change rapidly for any time soon. So being able to provide data and people to be able to consume that digitally in their own homes is, is very, very important. MBS as well. We also um, conducted a manufacturer survey in April um, on the same vein. And nearly all of the manufacturers, you can see there, 98% had had some significant changes to their company's operations. Um, so it's it's had a massive, massive impact um, has this situation. But from that as well, we were told that over 35% of the manufacturers um, had seen an increase in the request for digital information um, from, from their specifiers. So a lot are starting to look at this. Um, we're having a lot of conversations with people at the Mini 2 are really considering digital marketing um, as part of their budgets at the moment. Um, and we'll, we'll touch on that in a little bit, but it really is an area where you need to focus. And then from an MBS point of view, obviously, we can back this up. So we have a cloud-based um, specification tool called MBS Chorus. This is used by hundreds of thousands of architects um, throughout the UK, and it doesn't need any um, software to download. It's just go to the website, log on, and with the license, you can then start to write your specifications um, online. There's some um, little images there that you can see, and I think my colleague Stephen's going to show you this later in the presentation, but it's completely mobile friendly, so you can use it on a tablet, on your phone, on, on a laptop. Um, the restrictions of software um, aren't there with, with this particular product being cloud-based, and we've seen a massive increase in use on this um, through the lockdown period. I'm going to cover some of the stats in a moment. But if anybody would like to read a little bit more about this, um, Rack and Tur, um, published by The Times, have, have done a little cover piece on um, MBS Chorus and how it's helped neighbour architects um, to actually create specifications while their staff are now working from home. Um, really would recommend have a look at that. It's, it's a nice read. Statistically, uh, manufacturers are obviously keen to know the figures. Uh, what we've actually seen is 37% more logins to our online um, specification tool chorus, which has resulted in 41% more active projects than before the lockdown. And um, by default, 35% more manufacturers specified. So big, big ramp up in the past 12 to 13 weeks. Um, we can um, obviously share a little bit more information if anybody would like to know any more about that. But yeah, it's um, it's definitely happening and, and we're seeing this first time from within the MBS. So our digital, I mean, the COVID thing is one aspect, um, but day to day lives, we're seeing a big change as well. So I think the key thing I want to get across first is by digital, we mean machine readable. Um, digital is quite a broad um, context, but it, it's what's being used as the industry sort of wide term at the moment. And what is machine um, readable? We're talking about data that can be read from one computer to the next without that human input. So we take the information that's fed into a database and then this can be used to feed your website and they can talk to one another, for example. So that data is passed on. It's controlled in a single source. It has one place to be updated and it controls that electronically. That could then talk to the um, end users or your, your specifiers in this case to actually um, extract the information and put it into their software, whether it's a BIM software like Revit or Archicad or Vectorworks, or whether it's um, information going into a common data environment or a specification tool such as MBS Chorus. This could all be shared. But the key thing with that is, is that it actually um, removes the need for human input. So we can see that from that, that database through an API link, for example, you could have that information shared to your website. You could have it shared directly to um, a software application or it could be talking and um, vice versa. It's, there's a whole ream of different things. By removing the human interface, yes, this um, maybe does away with some of that face to face contact that you, you might have had originally. But what it does do is limit the amount of errors that are possible by um, actually misinterpreting or things potentially being typed wrong, etc. Um, so it makes things a lot more effective at being accurate. And then there's just our day to day lives. So we're all experiencing a lot of digital interaction now. Um, 
most people listening to this webinar will be um, sat there, obviously in front of a screen, um, so digital there straight away in this context, you'll likely have a smartphone. But even if we look at things like how we might order a taxi through an uh, app such as Uber, for example, or um, at one of these takeaway applications for ordering food, everything's going more and more digital and it has just become an expectation now it's not a nice to have anymore. And the way we do business um, is, is the same. Um, there shouldn't be any, any difference there at all. On that same vein, um, the um, government um, ran through the construction safety bill during the Queen's speech um, last year at the end of December. And following the Hackett report, um, there was obviously a clear identification that the, the system and the regulatory system in particular was not fit for purpose, particularly um, in respect to high rise and complex buildings. But generally, um, it was too complicated. And as a result, um, in December last year, um, the Queen announced that the government were going to take forward all 53 of Dame Judith Hackett's recommendations from Building a Safer Future. One of these things included the golden thread of information, which is a way of sharing information um, throughout the project in a digitised way. The next problem that brings then is this. So construction is under digitised. Um, it's actually far behind many industries and it's actually behind agriculture and fishing, um, which we can see here from the graph from McKinsey. Um, that sounds really awful in some ways, but if you think from, of agriculture, for example, if you go and buy a pack of beef from the supermarket, um, you could actually track that back to the actual cow and farm it probably came from because of the, the digitised information that's involved in the tracking processes, obviously for people's safety. Um, so we're looking at implementing those kind of things. It's very easy to think of um, advanced manufacturing, automotive, aerospace, um, information technology, that kind of thing for mobile phones and such, um, which are really, really see massive benefits in digital. Um, but construction is also an industry that can learn a lot from those that have already adopted it. So what's going to change? Well, the main thing is, is that manufacturer's product data is the cornerstone to all this working. Without that information being digitised and structured in a correct format, it all falls flat. So we really, really need to push boundaries, uh, particularly as manufacturers, to make sure that we are becoming more digital, providing our data in, in a very, very clear way um, and allowing the industry to, to evolve and become a safer, more responsible um, place to work and um, deliver a better end product. So just going to talk about the move to BIM. Um, I mentioned the golden thread just and um, how that's going to be implemented. BIM is a fundamental part of this. So building information modelling, um, the I being the um, key part with the information is, is going to help this. For anybody that's not 100% sure what BIM is, just very quickly on the slide, I know a lot of people are now, so we'll try not to cover this too much, but... Historically, manufacturers have always provided um, some way for specifiers and, and in particular the architectural community to, to use their products. Um, furniture, sanitary wear, etc. may have provided a stencil. Um, it was something that was quite common. But then later down the line in the 90s and then the 2000s, this was replaced by um, the DWG CAD blocks. So people were providing those. Alongside something like that, which these are obviously just static drawing images, um, you would have had your catalogue. Um, we're going across the theme here from, from Ideal Standard, looking at their blue book and, and some of the CAD blocks. Um, that was then replaced with maybe a website, so all the information that you had in that catalogue would be contained on that. And in a nutshell, that's what a BIM object is. So what we can see here is a Revit family. Um, this, is, this is a Revit BIM object. Um, you can actually um, use the 3D element of, of the CAD part to actually build the model, but within that there's also that data that would be contained within your catalogues and in your websites. It, it's not something that's um, revolutionary new or overly complex. What's happened is we've just literally joined the two things together, so they are not separated anymore, which is helping coordinate and again reduce errors and speed time up. We hear a lot in the, the press as well about data being the new oil. There's a lot of um, value in data. If you look at businesses such as Google, Amazon, Facebook, these are all data-driven businesses that are really, really pushing boundaries and, and bringing in a lot of revenue. And along that BIM theme, um, that, is, that is still the key message. Data is number one. Um, if you get the data right, um, you're going to be in a really good place. But that said, looking at the geometry, a stencil couldn't do that. So what we've got there is a Revit that was done in a render, sorry, that was done in Revit. Um, it's not used any additional applications, though there are um, some which um, MBS have, have covered in previous webinars that can enhance this and allow you to do things like virtual reality, which really helps to communicate that design intent direct from the BIM model. 
Um, but these objects here were all downloaded free from um, the MBS National BIM Library at the time, and it was just rendered within the software. This removes the need for people to have um, specialist um, applications, specialist software, or maybe um, it could be a small practice that doesn't necessarily have the funding to actually um, employ a specific um, visualization expert, for example. So they can just run these things now straight out of the software, and it's all reliant on that manufacturer product um, geometry. If that's not there, the render's not going to look so great, but obviously for you as manufacturers, being able to show somebody what your product looked like in, in a real life situation um, is half of the, the battle of getting the product specified and along with the data, you're onto a winner with both. Just going to talk a bit about PIM systems. Um, so we did a little bit of research at MBS recently and um, the responses were a little bit low, um, partly I think down to the, the furloughed staff in the industry because of COVID, but also I think a lot of it was down to the lack of awareness. Um, the actual respondents that did come back were very unaware of what PIM systems were in general. So I'm just going to cover what a PIM system is. Obviously we're in summer now and the first thing, time you think of, of the word PIM is, is this. Unfortunately, that's not it for us. It'd be great if we were looking at trying to implement that on a daily basis, um, but it's it's not the, the drink that most people would enjoy with a barbecue, etc. What a PIM system is, is a product information management system. So it's a way of managing your information um, and it's done through a software. PIMs are becoming more widely used. Um, I wouldn't class them as the norm now, but particularly a lot of the larger manufacturers, the sort of um, hundreds of thousands and, and sort of million pound turnover businesses starting to implement these, particularly if they have a lot of products um, because it helps them manage things like new product introductions and so forth um, a lot more easy. Um, by having one of these, it helps you to have an internal efficiency drive. So what it does is it puts all the data in one place basically in, in the database like we saw with this machine readable data slide earlier on um, and has that in a software that dependent on um, what product you're putting in you share different information but the properties for each product are generally the same so if we had a manufacturer that made product a b and c um, the warranty duration for each might be different but the term warranty duration in the property field would be the same so if somebody rang up um, and said look I'm considering it buying or specifying one of these products could you tell me what the warranty is on this very quickly somebody could refer back to that or if it was powering the website you could go and check and it would have that continual tidy data set for every single product um, again that can then power e-commerce um, or, or your websites generally um, if it's digitized and it would be a digital machine readable data if you did have a PIM. It helps you control new product introductions so managing things like stage gates um, has, has the product been tested can it then move to stage two um, has it got all the relevant information from a product management point of view before it goes to launch and so forth um, that all can all be controlled through there as well. It allows you to manage that technical information. So thinking back to that slide where the information as manufacturers as stored and provided is in a multitude of different places, um, it keeps that all central. So again, it, it's it's one single source and that can then power different things. But again, if you get incoming inquiries, um, you can actually refer to things very quickly and it makes things a lot more efficient as a result. There's then regulatory changes. So we've looked at things like the Hackett Report and the implementation of the Golden Thread and, and the people that are adopting this kind of technology are really setting themselves up um, to be ready when, when this demand's there. Um, and it's literally uh, just around the corner before we're going to actually see this this being needed um, as a demand. Um, but today it's it's very much a priority for a lot of people anyway. And then there's a whole host of other reasons which, which we could talk about. But if anybody wants to know more, again, just drop us a note at info at mbs.com. Some common misconceptions with what PIM systems are, um, and this came back from that research that MBS did. Um, a lot of manufacturers seem to confer, uh, confuse a PIM with a CRM, which is your, uh, your customer relationship management tools. This is things like Salesforce, um, uh, SAP, etc. Um, a PIM isn't that. You could integrate a PIM with, with CRM, particularly if you wanted to manage data in that way, but they are not the same thing. They are two very different tools. There's then digital asset management tools or DAMs, um, which tend to manage things like um, JPEGs, uh, so photographs of your products, PDFs, your certification, anything that has a physical sort of um, visual presence can be held within those things, CAD files and so forth. Um, and then we get product lifecycle management tools. Again, that was something that had been confused with the PIM. Um, 
similar vein, but again, slightly different. And then we've got things called master data management tools, which ultimately could maybe do all of them. A PIM could be integrated within an MDM as long with the DAM and, and maybe even link into the CRM system. So that is a sort of a overarching um, tool, but a PIM system isn't any of those things specifically. There's then um, the consideration of PIM providers. So it's a very, very clear benefit for manufacturers to actually um, implement a PIM if they haven't got one. Um, you can go and buy these things off the shelf and there's a load of different brands there that are um, providing these things now. Um, but where to start could be quite confusing. Um, some of these might not necessarily be suited directly to your product type or your business, so there might be some tailoring or you might need to actually get a fully tailored solution um, through software development. That said though, um, regardless of which route you decided to go down, um, they are a benefit. They'll help you become more efficient internally. They can power your websites and make updates to things like that very, very easy and straightforward. Um, you can control your product introductions. You can manage your technical information better, controlling revisions, but ultimately future-proofing your business. That said though, there are a lot of things that you should be aware of when, when looking at implementing one of these. Um, you can have the best PIM in the world, but if it's not filled in, it's completely pointless. It's a similar situation to having the best employee in the world. If they don't turn, turn up for work, what's the point? Um, so past experience I've had with these things is that they can be quite messy if they're not policed properly. So really you need to incentivize this and, and have a, a policy internally for actually inputting the data, make sure people are doing it and that you could actually be reprimanded if that's not controlled properly. Um, and on the same vein, maybe look for a data controller, somebody that actually looks after that and makes sure it's up to date. If you have too many of these admins, though, it can then result in duplicated information. So when he gave the example just of warranty duration, um, you, somebody could call that warranty. The next person might type in warranty duration or warranty length. Now, the data for that will be the same regardless um, of whatever the title's been called or the property. Um, but you end up with an absolute mess. So make sure it's kept clean, make sure somebody's maintaining it and keep it structured. Um, an off-the-shelf PIM system is a great idea and we've just looked at some of the brands that, that could help you with that, but it might not necessarily be suited to your needs. Um, I think one thing to factor in there is that these things are aimed at the manufacturing sector generally, not just construction product manufacturers. So it could be somebody that's making kettles or radios or um, car components, for example. Um, it's going to be quite generic and there will probably be some tailoring that is, is needed to help you. Um, any solution is probably going to require annual maintenance agreement. So you need to make sure that um, that's in place. And importantly, that if you do go down this route, you've got a service level agreement. So the SLA um, in your contract. Um, if these things go down and you're reliant on this as, as a source of information for things like your website or technical um, helplines, etc., uh, having any issues with that could actually impact your customers and, and ultimately your sales. So make sure that that's in place. How can people get started? Well, first off, it doesn't need to absolutely cost the earth. Um, you could start with Excel. Getting your data structured against relevant properties is, is a good start. MBS have a, a whole host of um, free product data templates that people can go and download for um, thousands of different um, construction product types. So if you want to know more about that, again, drop us a note, info at the mbs.com, and we'd be happy to share those with you. Um, having your data structured in Excel at the beginning, if you do look at implementing a PIM or you're looking at um, sort of maybe promoting your data through a third party website, um, it's going to allow faster import of your data. So when you get to that point, you're going to be a lot more efficient and that job's going to be done a lot much more quickly. Um, most of your team's time will be tidying and pulling all that legacy data together once you've decided to go down this route, whether you're starting off um, in, in sort of the quick and dirty Excel way or whether you're going full on implementing a PIM um, out of the box. Um, Past manufacturers I've worked for, um, especially some of the larger ones in particular, uh, would have different factories sometimes in different places in, in the world. Um, they would control different product types and the data would be held by each. So getting all of your brand's product data structured and in line can be quite a very laborious go um, sort of fetch task. So consider that, think about it and, and plan for it. So... That all then would help to um, enhance your digital marketing, which is the whole point of what we're trying to look at here. Um, in recent weeks, there's a lot of businesses that have started to look like this, have staff have been furloughed or people have started to work from home. There's obviously cost savings there in, in actually running these buildings. So the electricity consumption's down, facilities management's not gonna be as sort of pressed on and, and even filling the coffee machine up, something as simple as that. We've, we've seen a lot of savings being had by people not actually attending uh, or being in the office. 
because then your fleet, if you've got sales staff or external staff that have company cars, etc., these things are now um, starting to gather dust a little bit. Um, so, yeah, this is obviously quite a sort of play on that image, but you get the idea. It's it's something that, that's changing. I've spoke to a few manufacturers in the past few weeks and some have saved in excess of sort of £35,000 through the lockdown period in travel expenses, some even radically more than that. Um, and a, a great idea is to really invest that back into your digital marketing strategy if you can. Um, take the time to, to get things right. And then there's your, your clients themselves. So again, they're in exactly the same situation. Um, we've got an image of a specifier here that, that was taken from, from Google. Um, and you can see that they're the juggling looking after the children whilst trying to do the work. Now, at the time when you're working, they might not necessarily be contactable. So at 10.30 at night, when the kids have finally gone to bed and sat down with a cup of tea or, or wherever, they might look at them. Yep, I need to get this specification finished up before I go to bed. Um, they need access to that information then. And the only way to do that is to get it digitally. So picking up the phone and ringing you at that particular point is, is not good for anybody. And then there's this situation. So um, just to sort of add a little bit of proof to the pudding, if anybody um, like myself and, and most of the families that I know has tried to get delivery slots from the local supermarket since lockdown began, trying to get one is like gold dust. Um, we, we couldn't get one for love and money. And even now logging on websites, I mean, these these were two uh, direct images that were taken from two of the, the more well-known supermarkets in the UK and local to my area and no doubt the same across the country. Um, all the delivery slots were sold out or you were placed in a queue and they said that they might have, have deliveries. The reason for that, obviously, is that people are consuming things digitally now. The people don't want to have that contact. They want to go online, order what they need and have it delivered. Um, and specifying is, is no different. People are looking at doing that in the same way. And then if anybody's got teenagers in particular, uh, but it's, it's no doubt it's an industry wide thing. Obviously, we're putting more and more reliance on the Internet. So getting this buffering symbol or seeing things trying to download and taking a while is only showing that there is basically more load and traffic through the net. And it's because more and more people are using online services and your clients are no different. So try not to see it as a problem. Um, yep, yeah, we're seeing a lot of changes, but there is only one letter difference between the word change and chance. So what you really want to do is see this as a chance to actually change how you're working for the better. Um, there is a lot that you can do with digital marketing strategies to actually get your product um, sales uh, performing a lot better. Um, again, some little ideas here. <clears throat> Anybody that's probably seen an increase in their use on social media or how they're consuming um, products and things through through the Internet, um, construction products, um, specification and purchases is going exactly the same way at the moment. We've, we're seeing this in every shape um, of life at the moment. So on that note, with, with these things, um, obviously, there's a lot of boundaries that get crossed. So who would foot the bill? Well, for things like websites and social media use, um, th these are obviously it comes down to your marketing budget generally for that. Um, but with BIM and PIM systems, these start to become quite technical, so it can be quite confusing. Um, there's really four key areas within a business that tend to um, get affected by this. There's obviously marketing, sales, product development and product management. Um, so all people will benefit from that technology. But generally for a PIM system, it's usually product management and marketing that see the most benefit for that. Um, the reason being is they can access the data that is contained um, within the business a lot more accurately and provide that a lot more effectively. And then for BIM, sales and marketing are, are probably where most benefits going to be seen for a manufacturer. The reason being is that your customers are consuming this content. You can market it um, in a digital way um, and promote that your um, thought leaders and actually getting up to speed with, with technology in the world and how that's working and ultimately it drives sales. So if you're looking at maybe reestablishing um, some of your uh, funding or maybe any cost savings that you've had as a result of um, the lack of operational side of, of spend, um, those really are where you should be looking at doing this. Importantly, though, um, make some time for strategy. Get this planned in um, as, as a session, maybe have a workshop. It could be an hour. It could be a whole day. It could be a couple of days session that you have with people, but do it together. Um, one person making a decision will probably end up in an OK result, potentially, but it's never going to be the perfect one. Um, so if you 
involve everybody that might be affected within your business. Talk to your marketeers, talk to your product development engineers, talk to your sales staff, see what they need, want what they're being asked for, etc. And then come up with a plan um, and pretty soon you'll be on to the right track. That said, what if budget is limited? So um, whilst we're seeing some people still operating and making savings, it's not the same for everybody. And sadly, there's, there's quite a few businesses that have seen a big downturn. Um, there are options for you. Um, ultimately, what you would benefit from is something where you could actually um, have a product that, that did both. Um, and at MBS, it's something that we've been working on for the past 12 months. And we've been working on a data solution, but it also allows you to do the marketing. So... At that point, I'd like to introduce you to MBS Source. MBS Source is an online uh, search engine for construction products. Um, it's a data storage for BIM content. It can store your catalogs, your PDFs, but importantly, it will store your product information digitally and is used by um, thousands of the specification community on, on a daily basis. This replaces the MBS's legacy products, so our IBA product selector, MBS Plus and the National BIM Library, will be replaced with MBS Source. And it's aimed um, at giving you an opportunity. So it's going to optimise that route to market by allowing you to do things digitally. It's going to overcome your data challenges. So MBS have actually structured all the product data into relevant classifications and templates for you already. We just need to fill in the blanks with your product information. Um, it's going to give you that competitive advantage in a digital era. And then ultimately, um, the aim is to get you specified more and win more orders. So that is a data management and a marketing tool in one. So um, if you still need to continue your marketing spend, and that really, really is recommended that, um, through the last recession, we saw that the, the businesses that actually continued to invest in marketing throughout that period came out the end um, better than, than the competitors that didn't. But ultimately, going digital now is, is requiring a lot of um, effort from people and it's getting some regulatory um, involvement as well. So if you can do the two things at once, um, no doubt that's going to help you save costs. So if you want to know more about that, again, speak to us, but we'll wrap up with a summary at the end. The idea of MBS Source is to um, give you access across the whole project timeline. So that's discovery at, at maybe the concept stage, at the Rima Planner Work stage two, design, so stage three, and then the specification stage, which sort of happens between stage two and towards the end of stage four. Um, it develops throughout each of those stages then into stage five of construction, and then ultimately in the use phase. Now, once your product's been sold and it's being used, you might think, oh yeah, that doesn't impact us too much, but um, part of things like BIM data sets such as Kobe focus on asset management, and we've already spoken about that life cycle value. So having your data structured to allow better asset management and offer a better life cycle value and costing for your customers is going to help you to become specified more. Just some key benefits of MBS Source, and then I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Stephen, who's going to give you a live demonstration of the product. Um, it allows you to list your company and your product digitally um, in that machine-readable format that we were looking. It allows you to reach the biggest practices, working on the biggest projects. You can upload your PDFs, your images, your videos, catalogues, and links, that kind of thing to it as well. So it, it really is this one-stop shop for your product information, but with the benefit of having that reach of the architectural community. Um, your product specifications by default through MBS Source um, go directly into the MBS specification software. So anybody that's using MBS Building or MBS Chorus will have your products visible to them um, when they are actually writing the specifications at the time that they need them. And it's going to help you build your brand. Um, doing things digitally will set you apart and it's going to help um, lead your business towards the future. And then ultimately, we're delivering digital construction together. That's 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 the main goal and something that we are really taking a lot of pride with at MBS. Okay, thank you. I'm going to hand you over to my colleague Stephen now. Um, Stephen, if you're ready, um, let's go. Okay, thank you for that introduction, uh, Lee. So I'm going to do a bit of a live demonstration now just to sort of show off some of the things that uh, Lee's been mentioning in the slide deck. So mbs.com, you can see that we've got two two web platforms, MBS Chorus for specification writing and MBS Source uh, with all of the, the, the manufacturer content. So let's just jump straight across and look at MBS Source. So you can see here it's a, it's, a, it's a modern web platform that allows construction professionals to find, select and ultimately specify uh, construction products. And we've developed this to pull in all of the content we currently have on our three existing websites, National BIM Library, RIVA Product Selector, and the MBS Plus uh, spec website. 
So we're, we're in this sort of transition period where uh, ultimately Source will be the single web platform from MBS. Everything designed using modern web technologies, single modern platform that you can access on your, your sort of handheld devices, your, your, your things like iPads, all the way through to working really nicely on a on a big screen on a, a PC or a Mac. As Lee mentioned, we deliver content that that's appropriate for the different stages of a project. So early on, if you wanted to have a look at case studies on say school flooring, you just come to the single search box in the center of the screen here, do a search, and that's gonna return you back get content that's relevant to what you're interested in. So you could have a little look down here and you can see from the images, we've got some lovely uh, school flooring examples from different leading manufacturers that, that serve the, the UK market here. And you can go and read about that, jump across to their website, and find out more from that manufacturer. Uh, do the same search, passive house here, topic that you might be interested in, jump across to the case studies and uh, either read a project case study or maybe an in-depth look at one of the uh, the products. Uh, as you then go through the, the project timeline, you might want to get 3D objects to drop into your model or pop it into your specification. So what you'll see is every, I think we've got over 1,100 manufacturers and every manufacturer landing page is the same where you get the contact details a little description about that manufacturer and then there'll always be a tab for the information they've provided MBS so products case studies literature and if we go just for example here to the products from this manufacturer top left it'll always be the the categorization using the terminology and behind the scene the codes from a uh, uniclass uh, 2015 which is the classification system for for digital information in the, the UK and beyond so I've quickly filtered there to see the three hardwoods loft ladders from uh, Premier Loft Ladders and then as you go down the page you see all of the technical uh, content. If, if I jump across to, to Hardwood Loft Ladders you can see now that goes across uh, a number of different manufacturers. Take that filter off it goes up a level and you can see uh, you've got different manufacturers here uh, with different uh, classified uh, products and it's the same experience for whichever manufacturer that you click on. So a completely different manufacturer now, and but it's products, case studies, uh, literature. And inside the products tab, uh, everything classified there using the, the Uniclass 2015 uh, terminology and classification system. Let's just do that same uh, search now on Windows. You can see window units, which is that sort of third level of categorization uh, going down uh, deeper. And one thing our focus groups have told us when looking for technical information from manufacturers is like, in addition to the declaration of performance, having that third party certification like assurance as well is so important when they're sourcing uh, products for their projects. So for, for window unit here, I could maybe, uh, I want to secure a window that's good for the environment, maybe looking at composite window systems, particular manufacturer. And here, just through knocking those filters down, you can see we've got uh, three products, all that's secured by design certification, classified as composite window units from the, the manufacturer of LFAC. And then you may be interested in the different performance uh, certified to, to British standards between the, the triple glazed option and the double glazed option. So you click compare, compare. And what you can see on the screen there is that same sort of experience that you'd, you'd get. I don't know. Auto Trader, Right Move, John Lewis, where you can scan down and have a look at how one product compares uh, to another product with that sort of uh, standardized terminology. In the MBS, with every manufacturer as they come uh, to their point of renewal or join us a new service, but we're really working on the quality of this technical content, aligning it to the MBS specification so that it is a single construction language across all over the next year we will go through the, every single product from uh, 1100 plus manufacturers to to make sure that content uh, really is, is is fantastic and it's there at the specifiers fingertips when they need it if you just look at this particular product here you see you've got a number of images uh, you see what's suitable for you see all that specification content that we'd uh, seen previously the classification uh, guidance notes against the different options and everything's connected 
So you've got a product here that has a digital object, but it's also connected to any literature. This could be installation manual, owner manual, or, or what have you. Uh, so we're actually digitizing the information that's found in these uh, PDFs. So this particular PDF here has digital information for for four of the products. And the triple players window, double glazed, and uh, different uh, window options here as well. So just as we saw earlier with the, the, the ladder manufacturers, it's that standard landing page, products, case studies, uh, literature. Uh, just to demonstrate the third party certification again, let's say if I'm searching for some loose fill uh, insulation, you get the categories. If you know which product you want, you know the product reference, you can pop that straight in. But if we jump across here, loose fill insulation, you want BPA certificates, and let's have a look here at this one. Front and centre again, all around users have been asking for this in the focus groups. Let's get that evidence of third party certification at the top. Another thing we found out in our focus group is before you get things like if you want a digital object or spec data, give us that context in terms of uh, what that product is suitable for. So we have application at the top of the page here, and you can see that this particular installation isn't for pitched roofs or floors. It's it's for new build masonry cavity walls with a particular thickness and a particular height uh, and what particular uh, standards and approval it has. So really getting away from manufacturer content, that's glossy brochure type things and getting down to here are the facts. This is the performance. This is what it's been uh, tested, tested against. And yeah, that, that's came, came up time and time again in terms of what the the, the industry is asking for and what MBS are now working with our partner manufacturers to provide. Uh, Lee mentioned the, the sort of 3D side of things and the, the digital model. If I want a security door and I want to have a digital digital object to drop into the to the design as well, you can say just show me the products that have the digital objects. So I might want an automatic revolving door set with a digital object and uh, that's just going to show you the products that are on our system that have the digital objects that you can download and uh, drop drop uh, straight into your 3D design object. So you might be doing a, a revolving door for a bank or a government building and here's one that's appropriate with sort of a Revit object that you can take and, and download and put into your design. Uh, Let's just to demonstrate the we have a joint venture with RIBA on the, the CPD side. So if you do want to learn from manufacturers about a particular topic like water proofing or what have you, from each manufacturer landing page, it's uh, it's shown clearly which ones are the RIBA CPD providers as well. And with the RIBA CPD, it's the double points as well because it's been approved by the technical team at the Royal Institute of British Architects to meet that minimum standard of quality. So that will jump straight across from source uh, to the RIBA CPD website. And one interesting thing just through the lockdown period is the content still absolutely relevant, but what we're finding is a lot of the manufacturers out there are, are, are recognizing that you're not going to be going into people's offices, their boardrooms, you're not going to go as many trade shows, if any, over the next sort of six to 12 months. So take this great content you've already got digitally, but keep that personal relationship there and deliver your CPD remotely. Whether you've got online videos that can watch or you deliver it using Teams or Zoom or uh, whatever web technology. So the content is still needed. It's the delivery mechanism. It's the, the quality of that digital data that's changed. Uh, and MBS are here, RIBA are here to help you get that information to your customers at a time where you can't visit them face to face by jumping in the car or you're not at a trade show for three or four days showing off, off things. You can get that information uh, to them digitally, being part of the, the, the MBS source platform and uh, working with RIBA on the CPD side. I mentioned at the start that it, we've got two platforms, Source and MBS Chorus. It's the same login for the specifier. So I'm logged in here as Stephen Hamill. I've got my uh, 
favorite products and manufacturers and little chunk case studies I've I've uh, saved against my user account. And I, I live in Durham, so it's quite interesting to see some of the case studies from Durham here, University, the swimming pool, and it's actually the garage not far from from, from my house. But uh, yeah, I'm logged in as uh, Stephen Hamill, and I can come and see my specification products and jump straight to them. Uh, straight from MBS Source. So that's jumping from Source into MBS Chorus, which is the platform that the leading architects, the leading engineers use to write their uh, specifications. So I've jumped across to a particular project here, Lakeside Restaurant, and there's my architecture. And just to demonstrate how the manufacturer information synchronizes, let's go to an empty project. So I think this one here, I'll, what the, in this case, let's pretend I'm an architect. What the architect would do would they'd uh, add their specification, see whether they want to classify it by common arrangement of work sections or Uniclass 2015. The manufacturer information aligns to both. And at the point where you're writing your specification, the manufacturer content is uh, positioned on the right hand side. So do a social partition system. Keep it nice and simple. Think of a sort of internal wall here, gypsum board partition system. And as you open that up and click on the manufacturer prompt, that you could write in there uh, to be decided, submit proposals, etc. But if you do know which you, you know which manufacturer you want, you know the, the quality you're after, that the, the leading manufacturers are there on the right hand side. So that information that you've previously seen in source it feeds into this panel inside a chorus. So you we got, got British Gypsum, uh, James Hardy, Knauf, and uh, I could pick, pick one of these. And what you're going to see here is the, the overall performance. Like This is quite a complex thing you're specifying here. It's not like just dropping a hand dryer or a soap dispenser in the spec. But if you want 60 minute fire resistance, 48 acoustic with a severe duty to the following standards, then uh, if I click add, this is going to drop the, the specification for this partition into the into the job click add and that just drops a straight into your specification and then you go through making the decisions based on the guidance provided from the the manufacturer so we've worked there with our manufacturer my partner can have to, to 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 take their technical information and put it into that perfect form just to click and add and then specify uh, what we've seen course is a collaborative platform so you can actually go through and invite other people to come in and help write the spec. And we're starting to see some manufacturers getting asked to, to come and complete specs. So if I go back to this here, the, the basic workflow is you, you add a set of things that you want. Uh, let's put ceiling in this time. And maybe this works better on this sort of more complex systems rather than simple products, but you could be designing and you write your brief at the top. So I, uh, and then what you could do is invite the manufacturer to the project and they'd not just say which products you need to, to meet the performance that you're asking for, but they can add in workmanship clauses and a system completion to make sure that's installed correctly and you get the correct testing and warranty at the end. And we have a we have a case study on our website from one of the early adopters here. If you go to the mbs.com resources case studies, there's a really nice example where Franklin Ellis architects were working on a big sort of office refurbishment job and they added another number of paint systems in. Things like painting for the floor, for external works, internal works. They put the brief in at the top of each of the system and then invited the spec team at Dulux Trade to come in and sort of complete the the specification so if you do have five or six minutes at the end of this webinar maybe drop drop in there and see how you can it's a bit like the cpd you've got the technical content that's correct to deliver but offering that extra human ser service and being a part of the project and getting that face-to-face -face contact over like uh, web meetings and things and help write the specification which the architect will ultimately sign off but that the, the mbs course collaboration features that next step on from our sort of basic digital offerings. So that's a quick sort of 10 minute overview of and mainly MBS source, but touching on chorus as well.
if you're interested in seeing more after the webinar, uh, come across to our events page and there's lots of on-demand webinars on things like chorus and source and some key topics like inclusive design, sustainability, fire safety, etc. And there's a number of case studies in here as well, where you can look at how practices such as Franklin Ellis or HMM, made by David Miller, BDP Rider, are, are making a success of the digital workflow working using the, the, the MBS digital systems. So back to you, Lee, to wrap up. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, Stephen. Um, some really, really great things there, and hopefully you've, you've all enjoyed seeing what MBS Source can do. I'm just going to summarise the session now and, and wrap up. So we've seen um, the way in which we work is, is going more and more digital. Um, this is something that, that we can't deny, whether it's an impact of just um, our social um, requirements at the moment or whether it's impacts from um, pandemic like COVID-19 or whether it's the industry regulatory changes. Everything is pushing us towards a digital way of working. Um, we're being forced to do this from one way, shape or form. So it's something that we really need to embrace. Um, digital marketing focus can aid your recovery as a manufacturer. Um, mentioned earlier on that through the last recession that those that were marketing as that went on um, actually came out the back end in a better shape than their competitors. So that's something that's going to be very similar today for no doubt. Um, the technology exists today. People sometimes see digital things as always a bit futuristic or it might be a little bit difficult to get involved because it could be highly technical, but the technology exists today. There's a lot of people like the MBS that can help you with these things. Um, talk to people, um, share knowledge, have chats with your maybe some of your peers and see what other people are doing. Look at other industries. Um, technology exists today. It can be quite um, effective and it's very easy to adopt in a lot of cases. But the key thing is structuring your legacy data and uh, making this digital is key. So for all of your existing products and any planned future products, get your information digital and get it out there, whether that's on your own website or whether it's in a um, product tool like MBS Source. Um, just make sure that you have it so people can access it and get what they want. And that's that key critical performance information, not just the, the, the salesy stuff that you want to add on there to make it look great. And ultimately, yeah, we can help you with all of that. So, yeah, drop us a note at mbs, um, info at the mbs.com if, if you want, and the details will be on the other screen. Just to quickly recap why we developed Source, as Stephen was demonstrating you, so um, that was to meet the industry drive for high-quality product data and those changes. We want to help our manufacturer customers grow their business and win more orders, and also for the specifier customers that we have. Um, if we can help their job to become more efficient, they're going to increase their um, revenue as well as a result. So it's a two-way win. Um, for manufacturers, it allows you to market your products more effectively, uh, more accurately, but importantly, in a digital way, um, which is, is the future and exactly what you need to be doing. And then as a result of that, as with anything digital, um, data is captured and, and we can actually give you um, insights and analytics into how your business is performing through that platform. Okay. So that's MBS Source. I hope everybody's enjoyed the webinar. If you've got any questions around digital, around PIM systems, around um, BIM content or, or just generally how things are going or if you're interested in MBS Source please feel free to drop us an email at info at the mbs.com um, or give us a, a call on the telephone number there all our staff are still working um, and we'd be happy to chat to you thanks very much to my colleague Stephen um, for giving you the demonstration and have a great day